Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Would the city, the mm -hmm. town clerk, please call the roll. Chairman Roberts? Present. Councilor Berry? Here. Councilor Carson? Here. Councilor Fritz? Here. Councilor Lynch? Here. Councilor McGinty? Here. Councilor Swift Kayata? Representative Gill? Representative Weaver? Manager McGovern? Here. And Town Clerk Lane? Present. And, uh, and Swift, Councilor Swift Kayata will be a few minutes late. She had a conflict with uh, one of the kids in the school events. So I said, make sure she took care of that first. Under reports and correspondence, any councillors have anything that they would like to bring up this evening? Uh, Councillor Fritz. Go ahead. I, I yield to Councillor McGinney. We're both on <laughs> the yeah, same committee. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to uh, congratulate a um, young sophomore student at the Cape Elizabeth High School who, uh, whose name is Henry Kramer, who won a piano competition. Uh, that the Portland String Quartet put on, and the performance um, was yesterday. And he did just a wonderful job, and uh, he played with the uh, quartet, and he also played a piano solo himself and, and really wowed the audience. So this young man has a, has a career ahead of him, I think, and, and I just want to congratulate him on his good job. Thank you very much. Councilor McGinty. I just want to uh, relate that the County Budget Advisory Committee made their final recommendations to the County Commissioners last week, last Wednesday. Um, the final recommendation was a 5.6 percent tax increase. Um, two members, Councillor Berry and myself, voted against that. We thought we could get that figure down a little bit lower. However, the, uh, the overall Budget Committee recommended that to the County Commissioners. The County Commissioners are meeting this evening as we speak. Um, they can do whatever they want, actually. We're, we're just an advisory committee. They can raise that. They could lower it. I doubt that. But they could raise that. Tax is even higher. Uh, that's at their discretion. Um, I'd like to thank uh, our town manager, uh, Mike McGovern, who made several presentations um, to the, the commissioners um, with specific ways that we could reduce their budget and thus reduce the overall tax burden on only, not only Cape Elizabeth, but all the municipalities in the county. Um, we made a valiant effort, and I'd like to thank uh, specifically um, uh, Manager McGovern and Henry Berry uh, for their efforts to try to keep the county in some sort of check uh, with their taxes. Taxes have gone up over 40 percent in the last five years for the county, and uh, in my opinion, as I've said over and over again, I think they're out of control. But uh, 5.6 is better than the 11 percent we started with this year, uh, but I think it could be a lot lower. But they're meeting, they're meeting as we speak. Unfortunately, we have a conflict, so we couldn't be there to uh, give our last best effort to get the tax rate down. Uh, but that's where we sent them 5.6 percent. Councilor Berry. Uh, I echo uh, Councilor McGinney's. Uh, I've served with him on the committee. I'd just like to point out to the citizens of Cape Elizabeth that the cost of living in the last year has gone up 2.7 percent in this proposed budget for the county is 5.6 percent, which is about twice what the cost of living is good for the taxpayers. And I think that we are uh, overspending, and uh, we tried to carry that. Two of us from Cape Elizabeth uh, voted on the Budget Advisory Committee against that. I think there's a need for legislation to uh, change the system that will allow two out of three commissioners for the 250,000 odd uh, people in Cape Elizabeth, in uh, Cumberland County, excuse me, <clears throat> to uh, pass a $25 million budget. That's a lot of clout to put in two people. And I think there should be a, a broader uh, representation, a more democratic process, and we hope that the, the legislation will come forth to accomplish that. Thank you. I don't want to waste time. Thank you to both of you. Anyone on the right? Yeah. Councillor Carson. I just wanted to ask the manager to put it in real dollars because it's something this county issue is something we've been dealing with for we as a council, but you specifically as representatives have been dealing with. What are the dollars 
$25 million. Just, I mean, I know what they are, but tell the people so that they have an idea what it looks like. The county For tax that the town of Cape Elizabeth pays currently is about 760000 Under the budget that's before the county commissioners this evening, it would increase approximately 60000 this is well over eight hundred thousand. Eight hundred thousand dollars for registry of deeds and the prison, prison, and the sheriff. For, for corrections, for <coughs> law enforcement in the rural areas, uh, for emergency management, for the register of probate, for the cost of the, the district attorney's office, not the district attorney. Uh, for uh, anything else, I'm forgetting. <coughs> Uh, the federal uh, mandates for the 9-11 uh, problems that have arisen. Yeah, through emer emergency management. Some of but them. you named five things, and only three of them actually benefit the town of Cape Elizabeth to the tune of $800,000. So I wanted the people to s see that this is really out of whack and that this is something that all the towns in the southern area should really work toward curbing county budget. Uh, I think we use more than that. I mean, people die in Cape Elizabeth, we use probate. People buy real estate in Cape Elizabeth, we use a registry of deeds. People get arrested, they go to the county jail, and so on. I, I think that uh, uh, we use more than just a, a well, couple of their agencies. Five out of eight things. The point is that we're but paying too much money for the services that we I get. I don't disagree with that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to carry that message to the county committee. Councilors? Nothing. All right. I uh, had the opportunity also to go to the county budget meetings, and I was as disturbed as everybody else was that uh, no matter what we suggested, they found ways of suggesting that uh, we were off our rocker. Uh, manager mentioned that they had put in for $1,000 for a copy of the statutes that are, are available elsewhere at, in the county building and available online, and they wouldn't even meet us on that one to, to cut the $1,000 for that. So. They weren't really interested in, in any of our suggestions. But on a positive note, I managed to go to the community services uh, meeting this past week. I was extremely impressed with uh, what that group has been doing with the new building and whatnot. And I asked uh, Sue Weatherby and the chair, Corey uh, Call, Cole, Co Corey, how do you pronounce that? Cool, thank you. If they would be willing to give us some of the reports and correspondence uh, just a real quick update on where they are with the building and their programs and how they're settling in over there. So, ladies, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Corey Cole. I'm the um, chairperson for the Community Services Advisory Commission. Um, we just wanted to give you a little brief update on... Um, Corey, can, can you just speak to... Pull up a little bit. Thank you. <laughs> um, a brief update on what the com what we've been doing at the community center, not we, but more likely the community um, services staff and what the community center has been used for. Um, the sheet that got handed out was just a typical week schedule of what's going on in the community center. Um, the seniors are very busy there. They, they've had um, three luncheons there to date, um, a welcome back fall luncheon. They're pretty busy during the school year and not so active in the summer, um, where they had a, over 120 lunches served. They had a Thanksgiving dinner and a Christmas party is scheduled for tomorrow with um, 83 people re reserved. Um, a lot of that has been going on with a lot of volunteer efforts from the community where people are coming and helping and um, serving and cleaning up after the senior events. Um, as you can see from that schedule, there's about 10 to 12 different functions or activities that go on in the community center on a daily basis in addition to the extended school care program that runs um, all day long basically with different age levels of children. Um, the extended day capacity has actually increased by um, 10 from the old facility. So there's up to um, 70 children per day. At, uh, there's a, the capacity for 70 kids per day um, there, even though they're servicing a bigger um, audience than that based on how many times a week a child comes. The interesting part is um, over 50% of the kindergartners are in, in, enrolled in some of the extended day programs, so that could be a real big message to our full day kindergarten. Um, other community groups that have had dinners in the community um, center have been the Garden Club, the Historic Society, and the Field Hockey Banquet. 
and there's a lot of other groups that are using the facilities such as condo associations the land trust scout troops cape life group church goers group edward jones rotary club they even had the kids id program there last saturday with the i think it was the fire department police department um so far this fall there's been 45 different classes being held in the community center which means um, they can meet one to nine times a, a period, so like in the fall, but there's 45 different ones going on there. Um, and they are also providing um, children's birthday parties there in addition to the birthday parties that are at the Pond Cove School and at the pool, the parties that they've been holding at um, the community center are, tend to be for the younger children because they have all the equipment there. Um, they're trying some new things in the winter and spring um, to have some drop-in um, opportunities for our seniors and adults on Monday and Friday mornings because that's not when a lot of the classes are scheduled. It just doesn't seem to be a popular time to have a class. They're also um, working with the middle school students to hold more social events for the middle school kids and hold them there at the community center instead of just at the high school, which I think most of them are there. And they are also looking forward to having a family time um, for four Sundays in March to have use of the game room, the big screen TVs, and the computer lab, which the computer lab just got set up last week. Yeah, last week. Um, the other point was that there is, the whole lower level of that building is being used for storage, and it's pretty full. <laughs> um, they're the central supply for the paper for the entire town. There's bus tire storage and all the community services, equipment storage, including the summer camp stuff. And then um, they just um, had the whole fruit distribution for the high school set up in one of the bays down to the stairs. Um, in conclusion, everything's been very overwhelming and um, great. Um, in a typical day, um, 250 to 300 people from the community either go to classes or attend daycare or are just there to register for programs. So it's, it's been very well received. Um, is there any questions? Glory, thank you very thank much. You. For those of you that haven't been to the building, I would really recommend that you go in. There, there really is an impressive array of programs for just the little kids all the way to the seniors. The building is extremely tasteful and just designed around the, the needs of the community. The, um, and Sue and her staff and all the volunteers have done such a great job with it that you really need to go over and, and look at it and see what you got for your money. We've, we have a bargain there and, and a real jewel. So, and, and it makes me feel better considering the heat we took <laughs> when we were, tried to enter into this process to find a place for that group. <laughs> when I went to the meeting the other night, one of the things that they mentioned, and oftentimes the seniors say, what are we doing for you? Well, the meals are, that they're getting at the center now, they used to have to go to Pakuta Club or over to the Congregational Church, and the meals that they pay for, they're half price. So we've helped out that way. So, uh, Mr. Town Manager. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Since you're so formal, Mr. Jack. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Jack. Uh, just a, a couple of quick announcements. First, uh, the council has a couple of additional opportunities to meet this week. Uh, one is on Wednesday night at the South Portland City Hall. Uh, there's going to be a session with the South Portland City Council, a workshop on something that the PACS Committee, the Regional Transportation Planning Agency, has put out as sort of a regional trans transportation plan for the region, uh, something called Destination Tomorrow. It's not something that all of the councillors will be attending. This is a real busy time of year, but all of the councillors are invited to attend, and the public as well, and that's uh, Wednesday night at 7 p.m. at South Portland City Hall. Secondly, there's a council workshop on Thursday night uh, here in this building at 7.30, and the primary topic, although there's several topics of that meeting, is the, is the lot in back of uh, the council podium here, what we call the former service station lot for a long time, as it was the Shell Station, uh, more recently the Irving and more recently the Blacktop. Uh, and citizens' views are solicited on that. You can send an email to the town website if you have any thoughts on that or, or attend that session uh, on Thursday night. Finally, I should mention, uh, for any of you who are wishing to access planning services in the community, uh, our planner is now out on maternity leave. She uh, gave birth to a baby girl, the 
to day before thanksgiving i think it was and i appreciate the efforts of everyone in the assessing coast planning office helping us during the interim she is going to be out for a while and we're going to try to get by without anyone permanently replacing her during her her period of family leave but she will be returning sometime after the first of the year and we look forward to her return and wish her well with the new baby girl so thank you thank you very much how about our student representative Marianne Endeavor, do you have anything you'd like to? I'll set for this All right. Well, each evening at our council meetings, we have two opportunities for citizens to speak on items that are not on the agenda. And at this point, uh, if there is someone in the audience that would like to take a second and uh, discuss anything or bring anything to our attention, now is your opportunity. Just ask that you state your name and your address and speak clearly into the mic. Is there anyone that has anything they'd like to say? Seeing none, we'll uh, I'd entertain a, a motion for the minutes, acceptance of the minutes. So moved. And a second. Second. Any uh, discussion or comments on those, Mr. Barry? <laughs> I have no uh, none tonight. Move the moments. All right. It means the English was probably done right, Deborah. <laughs> Thank you. This for the regular meeting of November 13th. This would be for the regular meeting of November. Was it the 13th, was it? Yes, November 13th. And the special session as well. We can include them into one. It was just a, an addition to the other meeting. I'll amend my motion to include them both. All right. And I'll amend my second. Amend the second. Very good. All in favor of accepting the minutes as presented. You can show it to be unanimous. Okay. The uh, first item on our agenda this evening is item number 59-02-03, a public hearing on the Gulf Crest uh, Master Trail Plan. The Conservation Commission uh, has been working on putting together this plan for a number of months to, for the proper utilization of the, um, the parcel that we now call Gulf Crest, about 113 acres of land behind the town transfer station. Um, I would ask that if anyone wishes to speak to this item, that you keep your, your comments uh, fairly brief. We have a number of people up here that probably would like to speak this evening. Uh, again, just come to the podium, list your name and your address, and uh, you can speak your mind, tell us what's, what, if you have any questions, we'll try to answer them at the end. So if anyone would like to get, and uh, before we start it, I guess I would ask uh, the, the chairman of the Conservation Commission, Mike Duddy, if he would like to have a few comments and explain what's going on, perhaps in a little more detail. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> My name is Mike Duddy. I live on 11 Crescent View Avenue. I'm currently serving as the chairperson of the Conservation Commission. On March 21st, 2001, the Conservation Commission had or held a public hearing for the town on the Cape Elizabeth Greenbelt system. It was held right here in this room um, in the evening, 7 o'clock. The room was absolutely packed, standing room only in the back, people filling the, uh, uh, the higher level right there. Um, and although people came to speak broadly a few people seemed to come to speak broadly in support of the Greenbelt Plan and others to offer other comments. Um, easily 90% of the room at that time was filled with people who came to speak specifically about the Gullcrest property. It was a tremendously lively group and the, um, uh, the number of people supporting some kind of recreational trail system on Gullcrest was just phenomenal. Um, it was so extensive that we recorded the minutes to the public forum on pages 13 and 14 and 15 of the uh, now adopted Town of Cape Elizabeth Greenbelt Plan. And there are several dozen um, comments reproduced there from supporters of a trail system on Gullcrest. And I bring it up because it was really from that date, that, um, that public hearing, that the Conservation Commission understood the depth of in, in um, extent of support in the town for something being done on Gullcrest and the Conservation Commission really got down to work to try to vision what that should be. 
Now, for those who may be here tonight that were at the earlier meeting, um, I should add that many of the comments that evening supported a fairly um, high level uh, recreational ski touring facility along the lines of a Twin Brook in Cumberland. Um, over the past year and, and a half and more, the Conservation Commission has examined that idea, concluded that that level of development simply isn't feasible from a cost or weather perspective. And what we're going to talk about tonight is a much more modest proposal. Um, but that will bring those people up to date. Let me just take a moment um, to make sure everyone understands um, what we're talking about. There are a couple of um, maps up here which people should look at when they come up to speak. Gullcrest is a truly extraordinary town resource. It's about 150 acres uh, located right adjacent to the town center in this large blue swath right here. It's owned by the town of Cape Elizabeth. We're not talking about easements, we're talking about a fee interest in land. And it has everything that you might want in terms of a natural resource. It has wonderful forest cover, streams, brooks, meadows, wetlands, tremendous diversity. It's just, it, it surprises me every time I go out there that right here in the middle of the town, in an area associated with the transfer station, we have such a resource uh, of great beauty. And it's right there for the town to use. Gullcrest represents a very important piece of the Greenbelt system, generally speaking. And I want to just take a moment to um, lay out the context in which we're offering this management plan. Back in 1988, the Conservation Commission at that time um, was um, uh, advocating a concept of a townwide system of Greenbelt trails, more or less running in a north-south direction from Fort Williams down to Crescent Beach of interconnecting trails. And that, ha that has been and still is a goal of the Greenbelt system. In 2001, the Conservation Commission updated the Greenbelt plan. And while maintaining that original model, emphasized more of a hub and spoke system of interconnecting Greenbelt trails throughout the town, servicing ideally every neighborhood, but connected to a common area at the town center or just adjacent to the town center, which is this property, Gullcrest. This forms the hub in this hub and spoke system. Um, it is the sort of major green belt open space resource with trails that will allow people to connect from several different directions um, to this resource. So it forms a tremendous link, both north, south, east, and west um, in the heart of the town. The Conservation Commission has used over the last year and a half, almost two years now, um, a very, uh, I think, well thought out methodology in trying to come up with a plan to present to the town council and to the town as a whole. Starting with that um, public hearing back in March 2001, uh, we took notes, we used it to initially examine options to rule things out, um, to move forward. We've held uh, meetings at the Conservation Commission level um, for a solid year or so working on the plan. Uh, the town had provided some funding for OST Associates to help with the technical uh, requirements of um, ensuring that we know where the boundaries are, uh, aerial photography and those sorts of things so that we were able to inventory all of the resources on the property. Uh, the Conservation Commission has held a workshop with the Town Council and gotten the Town Council's comments uh, approximately a month or two ago, if memory serves. Um, and the current plan that is um, offered has incorporated the comments um, offered to us by the Town Council. Um, we've had a lot of opportunity for public input. This is one more um, opportunity uh, along the way. Uh, the, uh, master plan is still draft. This is an opportunity for the public to comment on it. Let me just speak briefly um, and uh, tell you what the plan is after this lengthy preamble. Essentially, it's very simple. Um, we are um, proposing a town-wide, uh, a Gullcrest-wide, property-wide system of um, low-intensity, multiple-use recreational walking paths that the public can access 
from a couple of points that I'll talk about, but when they do access it, the property will have the kind of signage that will allow the public to access the trails. There are trails on the Gullcrest property right now, and they are used by the public, but it is an extensive enough tract of land that if um, you don't feel very comfortable in the woods, it's a little intimidating because you can go for a three and a half, four mile hike, but if you don't know where you're going, you might feel a little bit lost, and so the public isn't making great use of it. Uh, the trail system that is there has been constructed all uh, by volunteer labor, um, the, uh, almost uh, exclusively by the, the uh, local snowmobile club that has over the years made use of these trails, uh, developed them, um, cleared them, and kept them serviceable for everyone to use. The plan that the Conservation Commission is proposing uses the existing nucleus of trails that the snowmobile club and others have provided um, looks at it in a systematic way to make sure that the, uh, the trails make sense, provide users with a variety of loops of distance and um, challenge, um, and then uh, connect with the access points, which ultimately connect the property with the rest of the Greenbelt plan. Um, the uh, map that is here is the Exhibit 4 in the Gullcrest Trail Master Plan, which some of you may have had a chance to look at. The text is on uh, the town website. Um, I think, very simply put, the interconnecting, uh, interconnecting loops are a large um, trail system around the perimeter, perimeter of the property with several other options through the middle of the property. Some of these loops are primarily um, through meadows, which provide tremendous dog walking and bird watching uh, opportunities. Others come through wetlands and forest. Others come up steep little promontories and down. Some are on the land, as I said, some are proposed to be built over time. But the whole idea is to provide um, town, users in the town with a variety of walking paths um, um, or you know, classic skiing paths and that sort of thing. We're talking about, generally speaking, paths that are cleared to about six feet in width, have a combination of boardwalk and just clearing on the upland areas, um, um, and can be used by uh, any number of people. Uh, and uses. Key to the concept is connecting the Gullcrest property to the Greenbelt trail system. The major connection that um, we were envisioning at the time of doing the, the plan, and still is uh, the major connection for the plan, is a connection um, to the north of the Gullcrest property over the headwaters of the Spurwick River onto an existing easement that the town has across the sewer line. Um, which runs basically from the back of the high school, um, behind some um, um, houses, uh, Chancellor's Gardens, and the townhouses out to Spurwink. Um, we're envisioning um, a bridge over that section of the Spurwink. You know, the Spurwink at that point is only about four or six feet wide with a little bit of wet area, so the bridge would be about a 12-foot span. Um, and uh, we're envisioning something that we refer to as a signature bridge um, for the property at that point. Um, this is all quite flat, it's marsh, it's visible. Whatever we construct there is going to be seen by a lot of people and we're, look we're thinking of more than our typical low-lying, uh, unobtrusive boardwalk, but more of a uh, sturdy bridge along the lines of what you might find at Kettle Cove along the walking path with the railing um, on, along either side. Something that will be aesthetically attractive, will be sturdy, will take um, the, uh, the waters as they rise and fall, and will be something that will fit into the landscape. Um, the town has now had an opportunity to um, take advantage of another access point off Fowler Road. It's not shown on this map here, but it was the subject of a uh, public hearing of a few weeks ago. This would serve as a connection to the southern end of the Greenbelt Trail. Um, I think it's important to point out um, for those who were at the town um, council hearing of a couple of weeks ago um, that right now as the, uh, the uh, master plan is envisioned and proposed, when we say multiple uses, we're not discounting or excluding anybody. Um, it, the trail systems are currently used by snowmobilers. We make no comment in the plan about it because multiple use in our view means multiple use. Skiers, hunters, um, walkers, runners, hikers, bird watchers, and snowmobilers. The southern connection, however, 
we want to make sure the folks along Fowler Road and Fenway understand, is not open to snowmobiling and will be appropriately signed. The trail will be built in ways to restrict snowmobilers um, and perhaps gated or with chain or some other source of obstruction to make it clear that snowmobilers are not permitted to access or egress um, the Gullcrest property from that um, point. The signs that we're anticipating, um, I think, really make this plan work. And what we're envisioning is three kiosk-style signs. What we're talking about is something you might see at a larger um, hiking facility, the White Mountains, or something of that effect, with essentially a little hooded structure with permanently mounted signs that will have this trail system on them. And they'll be located at the parking lot right off Spurwink Avenue. So you can go and park and see the whole system spread out. It'll be located down by the ball fields in the parking lot down by the community garden. And it would be located right at the intersection with um, this connection to the uh, easement over the sewer line. So that wherever the public is primarily accessing Gullcrest, they will have the whole system, trail system presented to them. Secondarily, the trails themselves, since they're quite extensive, will be well marked at the various intersections by name and by distance. So if you're out there walking on the trail system and you come to this point, you know if you're going to continue around here, you've got two miles to get back to the parking lot, or you can just double back and just make it a, a short walk. We want to make it user friendly. Um, and uh, accessible to people of all walking capacities. I mean, out here is going to be challenging, and here easier. This access um, from uh, the Chancellor Gardens area will be, uh, we believe, quite manageable. Um, uh, by the elderly, it's going to offer something for, for everybody. <clears throat> In putting together the master plan, um, we've got a couple of goals. One, to let the public know what we're proposing. Uh, secondly, to have a plan that will guide implementation over time. Many of the trail systems here haven't been cleared, haven't been built yet, or haven't been upgraded. Um, the Conservation Commission has been tremendously successful <laughs> in using volunteer labor. Uh, over the years to construct the boardwalks and clear the trails and we would uh, it's important for us to have a plan in existence so that when the labor becomes available either through the high school or the scouts or whatever community group we know where to assign people um, and thirdly that uh, because the trail system here goes through a lot of wet areas um, rp1 rp2 whatever it is and needs to be permitted we want, through a master plan, to be able to take care of all the permitting at once so that over the next three to five years as we implement, the permits are in hand and the regulatory process is taken care of. Um, I'll just uh, finish my comments by saying that we have had several cost estimates um, for the master plan. Um, the cost estimates, if all of the materials were purchased uh, just for the material for the boardwalks and so on and so forth, in the order of about $30,000. Uh, we're not asking for town council approval of all of that uh, uh, right now. Uh, the plan from the Conservation Commission is to come back to the council for specific expenditure approval uh, when we're ready to do it. Um, we do not anticipate hiring the labor to clear the trails, uh, although maybe um, if we get into some very technical areas that may from time to time become um, necessary. Again, we go back to the town council for that. There is a cost associated with the one-time uh, comprehensive permitting um, of approximately $8,000. Um, and as we move forward after the public hearing, in addition to asking for uh, approval of the master plan, we are going to be asking for approval to move forward with the permitting so that we can have the regulatory process completed. Uh, that concludes my remarks, unless there are any questions before I sit down. Thank you, Mike. Does anybody have any questions at the time, or do you want to wait? Pretty complete. One clarification regarding hunters. Yeah. Um, I don't believe hunting is permitted in that area, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, bow hunting is, is allowed. On not, that property? Yes, but not by shotgun or rifle. Okay. All right. Thank uh, you. Let me, let me clarify that one bit. It is not posted against uh, hunting. The town does not give specific permission for hunting. What, what was that? What was that, Michael? It is not posted against hunting, but we don't permit. What did you say? It is. It is not posted 
as a hunt. It is not posted no trespassing for hunting, which to prohibit hunting is, is how you do that. Nonetheless, we do not give specific permission for hunting. But we, we can't discharge any weapons except during duck season uh, in the, March. The issue is bow hunting. Just bow. And it, as well as, you know, in the marsh area, some of those are federally regulated as well, and it, it, it's a different set of rules. I, do, I was just trying to clarify that we do not give permission for hunting because once you give permission, you, you, you might get into some other areas of Indeed, responsibility. <laughs> Councilor swift -Gatta. So, just to clarify my understanding, so is um, hunting mentioned at all anywhere in this Gullcrest plan? No. I didn't remember seeing it. So. <laughs> all right, we will now open it up to the uh, public to have a, a chance to speak to us. So. If you could, uh, anyone interested in speaking, come to the mic, uh, give your name and your address, and we'll see, listen to what you have to say. Mm -hmm. Quick, or I'm going to close it. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Ogden Williams. I live at uh, 5 Beach Bluff Terrace. I would like to start by uh, thanking the past and present members of the town council who had the foresight to, pur to purchase this property, Gullcrest property, for the town of Cape Elizabeth, and also for the uh, members of the council and citizens in the town who had the uh, vision to imagine and promote the Greenbelt Trail System. I don't know how many other towns in, K in uh, Maine have a series of trails and a series of open spaces uh, what, like what we can boast of, but I don't think that it can be very many, and I think it's a real asset to our town. I'd also like to thank Jack Roberts for being an informal steward and protector of this land for years. Uh, most of those trails and uh, good things in that land right now are uh, a result of uh, a consistent and a remarkable amount of, amount of uh, labor on his part. And also, speaking of remarkable, I'd like to thank the uh, Conservation Commission. Uh, I think that uh, their dedication and effectiveness over the last couple of years has truly been remarkable. And I feel that our town is fortunate to have this group of volunteers working on our behalf. <clears throat> I support the uh, Goldcrest Master Plan. I think it's a reasonable, well-conceived, and common-sense document I think that the pieces of the Greenbelt plan, uh, Trail have been falling into place, kind of like jigsaw puzzle pieces uh, recently. And this Grillcrest property uh, truly is a hub of the uh, trail system as it's conceived. I think that endorsement and implementation of this plan is in the present and future interest of the uh, citizens of Cape Elizabeth. I'm delighted that the first priority of the plan is to construct access bridge uh, that would connect to town center and the school system and uh, Brentwood and other surrounding neighborhoods. I do think that's a, uh, that is the first priority. <clears throat> I'm uh, delighted about the, uh, this plan as it's been uh, drawn up. I'm delighted as a Cape Elizabeth resident and homeowner I think that uh, the plan, uh, if it's implemented, will increase the value and quality of life and community spirit in our town. I'm excited as a teacher. I think that uh, with access of this land to the school system, there are just a multitude of opportunities uh, that as teachers we can have educational and recreational opportunities. Uh, we will be able to uh, do all kinds of things on this land. It's so close to the school system uh, and all the way from uh, kindergarten up to high school. There are ed educational benefits. And I'm uh, excited just as a private, selfish individual because uh, if this plan is implemented, I will better be able to access and enjoy this wonderful, uh, real legacy uh, to the people of Cape Elizabeth. The plan requests no specific funding, as I understand it, from the council at this time. Uh, the improvements are to be accomplished uh, largely through volunteer effort, and I, for one, am eagerly anticipating uh, joining any volunteer crew that's put together, and I uh, 
urge the council to look favorably upon this uh, plan as drawn up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next person. My name is Mike Moles and I live at 423 Ocean House Road, uh, which is actually quite close to this property and the green belt trails that lead over to uh, Great Pond. Uh, I'm also here because I'm chairman of the Boy Scout Troop Committee here in Cape Elizabeth. And I see this as a great opportunity for some good Eagle Scout projects. And I hope that the Conservation Commission will be in touch with me as they move forward with the plan because we have 45 boys in Troop 30 here in Cape Elizabeth and we're always looking for good projects for them. We've been doing quite a bit of work over at uh, the Hobstone uh, Woods area and uh, this and other projects around town. If you don't let us know about them, then we can't sign the boys up for them. So uh, give us a call. We'll be happy to help out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dave Weatherby. I live at uh, 3 Manter Street. Um, just like to thank uh, uh, the presentation tonight on the, the entire uh, plan here for Gullcrest. Um, I coach cross country at the high school and uh, will be also helping out with track this spring. I also happen to be the president of the uh, People's Beach to Beacon Road Race here in town. Um, I just think that this is a very exciting plan and um, I've wholeheartedly support it as drawn up. I do also think that it's a very reasonable plan and I'm sure I can convince uh, some of the boys and the girls to help out on the volunteer efforts of uh, helping put this trail network together. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. Sarah. <clears throat> I'm Sarah McCall and thanks to the town council for your foresight. I second, uh, oh, my address is 4 Avon Road, and I second um, Ogden Williams' um, congratulations for your foresight. Two points, one is that on the P2 committee years and years ago, one of the things that we really wanted to have happen was that we did provide for walking and cycling and skiing opportunities off the road. We decided not to build uh, bike lanes on Shore Road and on Old Ocean House Road and we talked about it being perhaps more appropriate um, to move people into wilderness areas and I wholly support that concept at this point. And the second piece is I'm trying to represent uh, the running contingent. Um, we'll, we'll benefit so much by the more holistic approach uh, to running as opposed to dodging the cars on 77 and Shore Road, and so it's great for us. And to be to be off the road is just a much more pleasant experience. I'm from Acadia National Park. I used to think to myself, why would anybody visit Southern Maine for a vacation? Um, I'm coming around. It's a pretty <laughs> nice area to live in. Um, so, thank you very much for your commitment to all the great recre recreational opportunities that this will create. I also have coached the young kids in cross country and we've spent extensive time on the one strip of accessible green belt uh, in kind of in the back of the um, middle school, Ponce Cove School right behind Chancellor Gardens. And we spent a lot of time on that particular strip because that was really the only thing we could access very easily and very safely f for kids first through fifth grades. And we'd love to have a little bit more room to operate. Um, they would say, oh, we're going there again. And you know, it's better than a street in the middle of town. Um, so that would be great. And, and the note that the trail would be terrific for people of all walks of life, including the elderly, um, I just wanted to make the comment that one day I went into Chancellor Gardens and said, I've got a bunch of kids who would like to go on the scavenger hunt. Would, it, would you mind if they came in here? Because it's on our way. And they said, send them in. That's perfect. We love to have people stopping by and seeing us. And the, and the residents love to have, see kids playing outside. It's, it's normal. It's wonderful. So they were very welcoming of our use of that area behind their facility, which was a great afternoon um, had by all. So thanks again. Thank you. The 
Good evening. My name is John Upton. Uh, I live at Fort Julianne Lane. For the last eight years, my wife Annie and I have been volunteer coaches of the Cape Elizabeth High School Nordic Ski Team. And I'm here tonight uh, to speak to uh, some issues that I, I think are important to hear about the Gull Crest property and its uses that may not be entirely consistent with what the Conservation Commission has in mind. Uh, I guess I'm going to put in a plug for a, a little bit broader use of that property. Uh, in particular, I'm concerned that the trails that have been uh, conceived, at least as to a portion of them, uh, are going to be too restrictive in their size to be used by a lot of uh, primarily kids in the school system that could make great use of them. Um, to give you an example, this winter we have uh, 60 uh, middle school and high school children in the ski program. We spend uh, literally uh, hundreds of hours uh, busing those kids uh, to various places, primarily uh, out to Twinbrook, at, at, it was mentioned by the Conservation Commission, to find adequate trails. Um, when we, uh, the commission mentioned six foot wide trails for skiing and for that matter for any kind of competitive running, you'd need a trail that was, I'm going to say roughly the width of one of the columns uh, here, maybe eight to ten feet. And I, I would hope that they, uh, the commission and the council would consider at least on some portion of those trails, maybe three, maybe five kilometers, uh, keeping a long range plan in mind that would allow trails to be built for that location so that they could be used uh, by the skiers and by the, uh, uh, the kids in the running programs. Uh, it just won't be wide enough to be of use uh, for that kind of recreational purpose. I don't think that that means that all the trails need to be uh, built to that specification, but I would hope that some could be built to that. Thank you. Thank you. David Wing, 80 Oakhurst Road. Um, <clears throat> I would just like to speak to that. I used to run a ski touring center. I teach cross country skiing. Um, six foot is pretty narrow for anybody to ski on and successfully pass another person. It, it's awfully narrow. And I would endorse the, the proposal to have at least a portion, a coherent portion, either from the beginning or <coughs> fairly soon, cut to eight adequate, not good. Twelve feet is better. And um, any trail that's going to be used in the winter, and the Conservation Commission probably knows this, any trail that's going to be used in the winter by people on skis or snowshoes you have to be aware that what's up there now tends to fall down when it's covered with snow. And um, that takes a tremendous amount of clearing to get the, tr the tree limbs. So um, if it's wider, it's less of a problem. And one other point, which is that I haven't heard in the discussions about uh, mountain biking, which is a community that uses the formal and informal trail network quite heavily. And I would encourage outreach to that group, many of whom are very interested in cutting and maintaining trails. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Muzzy Barton. I live at Three Gordons Lane. Um, I'd also like to speak to the two points that were just made regarding the uh, cross-country skiing use of the trails. Um, I've been involved with the Cape Nordic program for about eight years. Um, I'm currently one of the assistant coaches to the middle school program. Um, I would reiterate what John Upton said, um, that I think it would be very, very helpful if some portion of that, of those trails, could be clear to the extent that they would be more suitable for cross-country skiing. Uh, this coming Thursday, we're going to get the kids on the bus, as John said, and we're going to bus them up to, to Cumberland. And actually, several times during the year, we also are going to take them up to the new Pineland Ski Center up, up in the New Gloucester area. 
and it would be terrific if at some point we could, um, instead of having the kids hop on a bus, we could uh, get them over to Goldcrest and, and utilize um, that area. But again, I think it would be necessary that, and again, I don't think it needs to be the entire system, but I think if we could have five or six or seven kilometers of that area made more suitable to Nordic skiing, um, that would be a great asset to the Cape Nordic uh, program. But it also would be a great um, service, I think, to other members of our community, elderly included, that would like to um, take the opportunity to do the cross-country skiing. If you've been up to Cumberland and skied at, at Twinbrook, um, there are certainly the, the uh, Greeley High School teams are competing up there and training, but it's amazing how many other citizens of Cumberland are out there skiing, and I would love to see that um, at some point in the future um, here in Cape Elizabeth. Um, the other thing that we entertained at one point was the possibility of perhaps hiring a professional to help design uh, trails. Um, and again, there would probably be some costs incurred in doing that. But um, I know we, we looked, and this is, this is actually the process that the, the people up in Cumberland did at Twinbrook. They hired a guy named John Morton, who's a professional at designing and laying out Nordic trails. And that would also be something I think that we might entertain at some point. And I also know, um, as an officer of the Cape Nordic uh, Ski Club, that we as an organization would be very willing to take our um, students and our, our parents and, and our group as a whole and, and offer some volunteer service to help clear those trails. I think we as an organization would be very interested in doing that. But again, I, I, I really think that, and I commend the, the master plan. I think it's terrific and it's going to create terrific access. But I think maybe we need to go that one step further um, so that it would, would be suitable for um, the Nordic program and actually also for the cross-country runners, I think. And I, I know uh, Dave Weatherby is interested perhaps in, at some point in extending the cross-country running uh, competitive trail and maybe at some point it, they might race up, up in the, uh, the Goldcrest area. But um, I think that's one thing that we might consider going just that one step further on some of those trails. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else that would like to speak to the council? All right. I, I'm curious to ask um, some people that are involved in the Nordic program if some of the open areas of both Gullcrest and the town farm around the perimeter of the town farm, I, mm -hmm. I don't know how far that would be, whether that'd be five to seven kilometers that you're talking about. I'm concerned about clearing wider areas through the woods, through wetlands. Dave, can you respond to that? Yep. It appeals, but it doesn't work terribly well once the wind comes up and the snow blows away. That's one of the reasons why it's nice to have trails in the woods. It takes them longer to be skiable, but they're not exposed to the wind. They're not as exposed to the sun. They don't ice over. Certainly, trails in the open are, are wonderful when there's only a couple of inches of snow, because then you can get out and actually get from point A to point B without wrecking your skis or yourself. But it, it has to be balanced by um, sun exposure, wind exposure. I used to groom um, up in Freeport for L.L. Bean when we had a touring center on the golf course. And there would often be wonderful skiing in the woods, but no way to get people to it, hmm. because the wind would have blown all the snow off the golf course. So yes, I think using the open spaces makes a tremendous amount of sense, but it's not, it's not um, always going to work, particularly when we have so many freeze, thaw, rain, snow events. Hmm. Thank you. I guess we call the public session closed and ask the, if somebody from the council would be prepared to make a motion uh, for discussion purposes. But, uh, have a motion to uh, accept the uh, 
Gullcrest plan as presented uh, and authorize the permitting process as, as part of the uh, motion. Uh, I, I believe the language on the, on the agenda is a consideration of adoption of the proposed master plan. So I, I would move to adopt the proposed master plan for trails on the Gullcrest property. And authorize the And authorize to proceed with permitting. Thank you. Second. And a second. <coughs> All right. Discussion. Who would like to lead the way? Councilor Lynch. I, I guess mine is more in the way of a question for Mike Duddy and the Conservation Commission and perhaps the town manager. But um, I'm glad, Mike, you um, reminded me of how many people were here in that meeting in March um, of 2001. And again tonight, I think we've seen a strong cross-country ski contingent. So my question is, how difficult would it be for us to, per to, do, to look at permitting a wider trail now? Whether or not it's developed late, later, I think, would depend on a number of factors, not the least of which would be money. But what, what I know we're trying to do is to permit the whole thing now and get all the permits we need so that we can go ahead and then develop it. So um, what's the possibility of trying to accommodate some of the interests we heard about tonight in the permitting process? Mike, do you want to come up? Sure. Actually, thank you for giving me the opportunity to answer your question and thereby answer some of the, uh, or respond to some of the comments made. Um, since March of 2001, um, and when uh, uh, we realized there was so much interest from uh, the Nordic skiing community to use the trails, it has been a consistent um, theme that we've had that we've got to do something that's reasonable, scalable, that we can achieve on a modest budget while not foreclosing options to accommodate a more intensive um, ski trail development in the future. Uh, I just took a look at the, uh, the, uh, the Gullcrest Trail Master Plan, and we talk about, um, even in the plan now, um, building trails to uh, a width of eight feet to accommodate, accommodate uh, mot uh, motorized uh, maintenance vehicles and that sort of thing. And when I did talk about six feet, um, I've been so focused on boardwalk width lately, I think that's what I've been thinking about more or less uh, predominantly. I think it's important to note that for instance, with the spur wing bridge that we've been talking about, uh, the plan calls for this to be an eight foot wide bridge, specifically because we want it to be there for a long time and to accommodate both the cross country running teams, ultimately if the trail system proves um, usable to them, and the ski teams. We don't want it to be a bottleneck right here. And we've always envisioned being able to expand the width of the trails and perhaps um, doing something with trail surface to accommodate the skiers over time, as the trail system gets implemented, money is available, interest is there, and the snow falls um, reliably. So uh, the plan as drafted currently, I think, allows for um, expansion of the trail width. Um, it is a good point um, that maybe we should put in the trail system some more pointed comment that, uh, I mean, in the, in the master plan, um, trail width expanded over time for accommodating uh, cross-country ski activities on those trails that are suitable. There certainly are some particularly wet areas where I think that is problematic, but there are lots of trail systems uh, you know, through here and through here that are high and dry and could easily take um, an expanded width trail system. Thank you. Anyone else? Councilor McGinty. <clears throat> I think along the line, same lines as uh, Councilor Lynch, and he used the term I, I was going to use. I don't want to foreclose the ability of us to accommodate the Nordic skiers or running groups tonight um, by adopting this plan and then they're coming back and say, well, you only said they could be six feet. Um, I, I would like to kind of go along the lines of Marianne and try to find some way to leave that option open, whether it occurs today or tomorrow or next year or two years from now, that's fine, but not foreclose the opportunity for us to be able to expand the trails to accommodate the Nordic skiers. So I don't know how we do that exactly. I'm trying to go through here and find where it says, mm. maybe Mike can help where it says six to eight feet. I haven't been able to find that even. Maybe I'm just not looking in the right place. I, I see where it talks about the bridge. 
I don't see where it talks about trails specifically. On page 6, section 6.0, first paragraph, the last two sentences. Okay. I read, existing and new trails should have a minimum vertical clearance to a height of 8 feet and a width of 4 to 6 feet. In areas where motorized maintenance equipment will be used on the trails, a minimum 8 foot width with additional space on turns should be provided. If the council wanted to do something more specifically, you could add a sentence, I think, stating that trail width could be increased over time to accommodate cross-country skiing and activities in those areas suitable for that kind of trail development. Could I then amend? Can we amend the motion then? I'll amend my motion to include such a sentence. Do you want to speak first? Let it go. All right. Yeah. Certainly, you can amend it. I'm not sure it's needed, but with the language that's there, but go for it. I don't think we should get locked in. I think that's, I think Mike makes a good suggestion that we say we can, you know, accommodate that, because it says, I mean, I don't get locked in this exact language, 6 to 8 feet. Doesn't it say a minimum of 6 to 8 feet, which to me would not be locking us in? Yeah. If it says a minimum and it doesn't state a maximum, I mean, I think we're okay with the language as it is. I have no objection to future widening if there's money and whatever, but I'm not sure we even have to change the language. I don't think it's precluded by what the language is. Mr. McGovern, can you? I'd like to make a couple of related comments. Master plans are master plans. The details of a master plan actually come in the actual permitting. Looking at this particular property, what I would suggest is the council go ahead with, you know, its motions and do what you want to do. However, that there be one additional meeting with the town engineer and with the conservation commission to specifically identify some areas that might be able to be wider without environmental impact, without cost, if the conservation commission wishes to recommend that, and for the council to see that before it actually goes to the planning board. So that, you know, it's not in conceptual, you know, as this is discussion, but you see the specifics as to some areas that might be wide. And I look specifically, and let me show you the map here for a second. Anyone can see from a distance, there's a slightly more, I'm in the right spot here, shaded spot going down here. There's actually an old coach road there that's not shown as part of the plan. Anyone familiar, there's a quarry down there, and it's actually where we put our road kill. We don't talk about that too often, but that's what it is. And, you know, that's a slightly wider area, does not have, other than the road kill, doesn't have any negative environmental impact. And it is specifically, I don't know if it's specifically tied in here, but that's an example of what anyone could look at to see what is a little bit wider, and particularly see in these areas over in here where it's not close to residents, where it's not close to some of the real sensitive areas over here that maybe you want to look at. I would suggest that before we go to the planning board for the permit, you look specifically at what areas might be suggested for additional width so that everyone understands. And secondly, while I'm here, we do have this issue, which I hate to bring up, of showing a trail that is due for purchase of an easement out to Fowler Road. That is, the closing on that is currently, I believe, due to happen the first week of January. And I assume that as part of our permitting, though, would be the inclusion of the permitting for the wetland portion of that as it's over and back of what's now the burnt property. And, you know, I didn't want anyone to think that, I know there's folks interested in that, and I just, my understanding is that that would be part of the master plan, including the permitting for that trail as part of all this, again, without snowmobiles, et cetera. Thank you. Councilor Lynch, I see you looking. Mike's suggestion works for me. I agree with Councilor Swift-Kayada that the master plan itself doesn't preclude it, and we don't need to micromanage and change the words. My concern, though, was when we go for 
whether it's the planning board or the Army Corps of Engineers, the permit is really quite specific. But if we're going to have another opportunity to meet with the Conservation Commission and the Conservation Commission will look at this issue again specifically, I, I think the wording we have before us in Councillor Barry's um, um, resolution is fine. And I, I certainly hope that we vote on it and we can get moving because it's a really exciting plan. And a lot of people, I think, moved to Cape Elizabeth for the schools. But when our kids grow up, I think we're going to stay because the town is just great and it's getting better all the time with things like this. Thank you. I'm just ready to move the question. Could I, could, could I, through the chair, ask Mr. Duddy a question? If the Conservation Commission were to have an additional meeting looking at that with the engineer for members of the public, when might that meeting be? Our, our next meeting is tomorrow night. I think that's a little <laughs> short notice. Uh, I'd say January. You meet the something? Uh, second Tuesday of every month. I would know, make a uh, special effort as well to let some of these representatives of the Nordic community know specifically where and when so that we can get some good input from them. And the neighbors as well will post it on the website. Right. Yeah. Before Councillor Casson cuts me off, I'd like <laughs> no. to... Uh, <laughs> you were looking at me for a comment. My comment is I'm thrilled with it. I'm All happy right. to move it. I'd like to have a couple of comments. We had the... Uh, Mike Moles mentioned the, the Boy Scouts. and I'd like to just recognize uh, Adam Milligan had earned his eagle badge by putting a bridge in that, uh, on that land. And Chris Thompson put in a fantastic bridge that followed Adams on the same trail. So we have used them. Um, as far as the uh, cross-country ski trail and stuff, yeah, there is land. It had to be up above. But you're going to have to assure us some snow. Um, last year, I think I got out once. Most of the time, we get rain at the end of your snowstorm in this area. And uh, the skiing is, typically is not great, other than maybe a few weeks out of every winter, so I wouldn't give it up on busing the kids yet until the, until the weather changes. Um, I also want to see it to be areas that can be handicapped accessible. Um, I guess I would not really want to see the kiosks going up until somebody else besides myself is doing some of the maintenance out there. And um, we really need to have a maintenance plan because it is labor intensive and you get having that kind of signage up and bringing that many people in, let's have somebody else give me a hand out there, please. Um, other than that, uh, I'm willing to move the question if uh, somebody asks for it. That's me. I, I just had Carol. to, um, I really want to congratulate the Conservation Commission on both the Greenbelt plan and this plan that, I mean, tremendous amount of work this year that you've accomplished. Um, and the Boy Scouts, um, sorry, the troop leader left, but all the work that they've done on the various trails. Um, I do, th I, I like this plan as it is. Um, I, I do think if we, we should be involved in the Conservation Commission involved in areas that we might decide are suitable to be wider, but I guess I want to echo what you were saying about, Jack, about um, the snow conditions. I mean, even if we had wider trails there, I, I'm a cross-country skier and I find it very frustrating to get you just have to take advantage when the conditions are good and, and the conditions aren't good all the time, so you can't count on it all the time. So like you say, you're still going to have to keep going to uh, Pineland and, and Twinbrook because um, they're more inland and, and the conditions work better. So um. Nobody would like the fluff more than I would. So. <laughs> to move the question. Go ahead. It's been moved and seconded. Has it? I missed yep. it. All right. You get it. All in favor of uh, the motion as presented then. Stay out of touch. Show it to be unanimous. Thank you, everyone, for coming and uh, participating and sharing your views. We appreciate it. Uh, maybe wait two seconds till the... Well, no, this one is different than what we had. This was in the packet, and this one. Okay. This one is. All right, Dave, I will. Thank you. Hmm?
it is. Very good. <laughs> Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. You look around. You can say, that's a point. You can say, oh, we've, we've got to look at that. What happened to our crowd? Oh, well. All right. Okay, we'll get back to the uh, business at hand here. The um, item number two this evening is number 60-02-03, a public hearing on proposed appendices to the General Assistance Ordinance. Each year, the um, General Assistance Ordinance has to be updated in accordance with the cost of living. Maine Municipal provides the, uh, each of the communities with uh, what the ordinance limits or uh, maximums can be in uh, each county or metropolitan area. And so this evening, uh, this is a public hearing. If anyone would like to speak on to the uh, issue of the General Assistance Ordinance, and if anybody has any questions, I'm sure I can answer them for you. But uh, so if there is anyone that would like to speak to this item, please come forward. Seeing none, the public session is closed. Uh, do we have a motion? I'm uh, Councillor, we'll, we'll go over the side this time. Is that Councillor Swiftkiata? Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I thought you started to speak. No, it was the mayor. Oh. But I'll do it anyway. I move we approve the proposed appendices to the general assistance ordinance. I second it. Very good. Yes. Any discussion? I keep on my toes around here. Mm. <laughs> Seeing none, all in favor. Oh, you can show it to be unanimous. Thank you. <laughs> Item number 610203, liquor licenses and special amusement permits for in by the sea property. Uh, consideration of approval of liquor licenses and special amusement permits for the in by the sea. Property including permits for the in by the sea, the HMH Limited Partnership, and the Fort Fairfield Yacht Club. And I would ask the town clerk if she had any comments on this particular one. Thank you very much. In your packet, you do have the applications that have been complete by the applicant. We have checked with both public safety chiefs and the um, code enforcement officer. They have not voiced any objections to this permit, or to these permits, I should say. And it would be in line for the council to adopt uh, and sign these permits this evening. And could I have a motion to, uh, to adopt? Councilor McGinty. Move, move approval. Second. And a second. Any discussion? Yes. Hmm. Councilor Berry. One quick question in passing. How many yachts are there in the Fort Fairfield Yacht Club? <laughs> <laughs> we, we take it up. We just mentioned it again. This happens all the time. There's no real ocean up there. <laughs> <laughs> Henry, I can't answer that one for you. It's a corporate name that Larry Mahaney uses, uh, yeah. who's one of the owners of the Inn by the Sea. And we know he might, has a yacht, too. I think he might be from Fort Fairfield. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Any further discussion? Door open. All in favor? <coughs> Again, you can show it to be unanimous. Item number 620203, uh, BYOB permit, St. Bartholomew's Church. Consideration of approval of a BYOB permit for a January 18, 2003 event, rain date of January 25, 2003, sponsored by the Society for Creative Anachronism at St. Bartholomew's Church. And I understand that they do have a representative here. If there are any questions, uh, and I'll pass that one back to Debbie as well. Thank you very much. Mr. Moles is here this evening and uh, will address the council if you wish. He would uh, be glad to answer any questions you may have. We do have one um, slight adjustment to the application. After talking with St. Paul Colonies, it's better for them and, and the applicant actually to have the snow date for the next evening of January 19th. 2003. So if you could please note that the applicant would appreciate that. Uh, his BYOB application is complete. Uh, they have worked with St. Bartholomew's to obtain the necessary uh, insurances and so forth, and we would um, recommend the council sign this uh, application so that the applicant can proceed with his. A motion for approval? I move. We approve the motion as presented. Second. 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 Yeah. I guess Councilor Barry got in there first. Any discussion? Uh, th this, the what it was, the change in the agenda is from the January 25th to January 19th? That's, That's correct. That's what you said, yeah. That's correct, you. yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Councilor Lynch. Yeah, I, I have um, some issues that I'm concerned with, and I mentioned this 
I think two meetings ago when we first had to vote on what I guess are called BYOB functions and the state has set up the town councils and municipalities as some sort of licensing agency for BYOB functions and the concern I have is that we don't have any criteria under which we decide this other than I guess a, a trust that because someone lives in the same town as us and perhaps we know them, we, we trust them. Um, so I, I, I feel strongly that we really ought to have some criteria. We just uh, did an application for In by the Sea, which was eight pages for a renewal. When we do one of these BYOB functions, we have half a page of information. Um, specifically, the issues I think we ought to address is what is the financial responsibility of the sponsor, the sponsoring organization? Um, how are you going to monitor consumption of alcohol um, at a BYOB function when everybody brings in their own? If you have a caterer doing it, you have a bartender who's monitoring um, consumption. How do you monitor whether or not minors are at the event and whether or not minors are drinking? Um, I mean, I think these are very basic issues. Someone suggested to me earlier today that by raising these questions, um, I would be trying to make Cape Elizabeth a dry town. That's not my intent at all. My intent and my concern is one of financial responsibility. And what I say to the parent of a victim the morning after one of these BYOB functions, if we don't have criteria in place. Um, St. Bartholomew's is, I guess, getting into the business now of providing their church hall almost like a, an Eagles Hall or some sort of uh, entertainment club. And we can't look to St. Bartholomew's for financial responsibility. So. Um, I, again, I'm not trying to make Cape Elizabeth a dry town, but I am concerned about our lack of criteria in looking at these applications. Um, second, it was also suggested to me that our role is simply ministerial. That this really isn't a license, that it's just ministerial. And I guess if that's the case, my suggestion would be that we ought to have an ordinance that delegates this to the police chief and anyone who wants to get a permit, can go into the police chief and just register that they're having a BYOB function. But if it's ministerial and there's nothing for us to do, we don't need to do this every month. And if it's not ministerial, then we ought to have some criteria. Yes, please. No. I, I, I agree with uh, Councillor Lynch that, that you know, in the long range, there ought to be criteria when you review any permit. Uh, the council does have the ability under the state statute governing BYOB functions to delegate this responsibility to another municipal official. Uh, I discussed it with the chairman today, for example, South Portland, uh, he did this research, I didn't, uh, <coughs> delegates it to the clerk uh, for all the catered functions, as Cape Elizabeth does. Uh, however, the clerk needs to check with the chief of police, as, as Deborah now does uh, for catered events. So. You know, I would I would agree with with Council Lynch that we do need criteria, and that this I would also agree that it ought to be delegated to uh, an official. Although I, I would have it the clerk rather than uh, the chief of police. Uh, also, uh, both Council Lynch and I independently called the uh, Department of Public Safety uh, alcohol enforcement folks today, and they I spoke to a Sergeant Lyman there. I think you spoke to well, Smar Smarha. Mr. Smaha. Mr. Smaha. Or Sergeant. Yeah. I don't know what his rank yeah, I get, is. I get Sergeant Lyman. Uh, anyway, uh, you know, I, I said, you know, why is it that we're doing this? You know, we hadn't had it before. And I mentioned that Sprague Hall has had BYOB's activities forever without, without a permit. And what, what it is is simply that the state was concerned that there were all these BYOB events all over the state. There was absolutely no record of them. There was no knowledge of, you know, when does a BYOB become a bottle club? And there's, there's other provisions for a bottle club. 
and they really want to keep a record of all of these uh, BYOBs so that they could be aware, you know, that it, the bottle club gets into more regulation of ours. The reason, according to Sergeant Lyman, that they asked the town for uh, the endorsement that's required under the legislature is just because they don't want to have to keep checking on whether or not the town is a dry town or that the town has uh, permitting that occurs, uh, as, as well as uh, they also want to be sure uh, that there's provisions in state law for regular liquor licenses that you can't get a liquor license or that the town could deny one on the basis of being within 300 feet of a school or a church or uh, a couple other things. And, you know, obviously in this case it is a church, you know, through this group that's applying for the license. Uh, you know, all that saying, uh, you know, it's up to the council how to, to act on this. Uh, generally, you know, you, you could endorse it and ask for us to do something further. You could not endorse it. Your options are, are really uh, limitless. Council McGinty. Um, I intend to support this tonight. Mm -hmm. um, I think it would be unfair to, in the middle of the course, you know, in the middle of the stream, change our voice. But I agree with Councilor Lynch again tonight. <laughs> it's scary. <laughs> uh, um, that perhaps we need to give the town manager some direction to come up with some uh, ideas about a, a, uh, a system or an ordinance or whatever it takes to take these out of our hands so that we have some um, information, further information, exactly what's going on. So I would support that. It could be done really just by council order, I believe, to delegate that particular That's function. Yeah, yeah, nothing major. Uh, I had a question, if, if I could step in. If we didn't grant this, can, they could proceed with this function anyway, correct or not? They could not have a BYOB permit without a... Uh, Municipal officer endorsement. All right, but but they could have a function and hire a caterer who has a liquor license, and again, presumably both some response, financial responsibility, and as importantly, um, many caterers have taken the state um, course on safely. That's only almost an oxymoron, but how to serve alcohol in a responsible way. So. They're not totally without recourse. They just couldn't have a BYOB, or we could delegate it, and they could get a permit. We could decide not to take action on it, and they could get a permit under as if we delegate it to the manager. Any is, further? Is there a motion? Is there a motion on the floor? Yes. Yeah, is there motion to what is grant. the motion? To approve the, <laughs> the request. I, uh, I don't know who made the motion, but um, I'd like to propose just a amending the motion that, that we grant it tonight, but that we also um, ask the manager to come up with a process for f future um, BYOB liquor permits um, so that perhaps the town clerk is what he'd come up with, but um, that there is a process to deal with it so that these concerns can be addressed. But I would by a certain date, like January meeting. Yeah. All right, we won't worry about it. I'm not worry was that an amendment? Was it that? Well, I'd just like to propose amending that. Do we do we know who made the motion? You did, and House very second. I did, but I accept it. <laughs> I accept the amendment. All right, Councilor Barry, are you willing to second the amendment as well, or I thought was it yes. Councilor McGinty? I did. Sure. <laughs> well, clerk says you did. Okay. I have a, 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 a problem with uh, short-term memory. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think at this point we could probably vote on the amendment or just the amended. How, what is the proper protocol? I'm the motioner, and I agree to include that she, amendment she in my motion. Out of you as and he agreed right. to the second. Okay. Whoever let's, just, let's just vote on the motion and get, get, get on with it then. All in favor? <laughs> All opposed? You can do six to one with Councilor Lynch. You're all set. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> unless, I, unless I want to try to do anachronism properly this time. <laughs> the appointment uh, of the Registrar of Voters is item number 640203. Wait, wait. Missed one. Did I miss one? 63. I'm sorry, Deb, I'm trying to move along too fast here on you. I did. Oh, Penny would never forgive me. 
Item number 630203. Probably would, Jack. Appointments Committee report, consideration report from the Appointments Committee recommending the filling of vacancies on town boards and commissions. Councillor Carson. Thank you. We, again, as we are so fortunate in this community, we had uh, almost, with the addition of two others, 30 people apply for various uh, boards and commissions that, 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 that are in this community and that have, that have vacancies. So we have these wonderful people who live in this town, and not only do they volunteer, they're all very talented in some way. And, and our hardest uh, job is trying to find a place for everybody. And it's, and it's difficult because you, when a person applies for only one board and you try to put them on a completely unrelated board, that is really difficult. So anybody who does, did not get appointed, because we do, did have more uh, applicants than, than openings, we encourage you to please apply again next year. These positions come up every single year, and uh, we wanted to place everybody. We made phone calls. We really tried. So this is what this is the slate as presented, and I will read this out to be part of the record. Um, for two openings for Arts Commission, we have appointed Alan Marcuse and Susan Lowe. For Board of Assessment Re Review, we have appointed David Scheffler. For Community Services Advisory Board, we had three openings. We appointed Robert Chatfield, Catherine Fairbanks, and Colleen Graves. For Conservation Commission, we had two openings. We appointed Julie Franklin and Jonah, Jonah Rosenfield. For Fort Williams Advisory Committee, we had two openings. We appointed Tina Harnden and Joe, John Snowden. For Personnel Appeals Board, we appointed Robert Packer. For Planning Board, uh, we had Robert Haddam. You know, we, for planning board, we had, must have, there's so many people that want to be on a planning board, a very difficult job. Is it Peter? Huddam? Peter, sorry. Yeah. Peter Hedem. And for recycling committee, we had two openings. We have Peter Ingraham and Sarah Choi. For Thomas Memorial Library, we have four openings. We appointed Dina Mayo, uh, Dina Mayo Bruns, Carol Ann Olson, Marie Reisenkowski, yeah, I have her, uh, Ed Nato for, for Thomas Memorial Library. The Zoning Board of Appeals, we appointed Joseph Guglielmetti and Gib Mendelson. And for Riverside Cemetery, which the name is off the bottom of your paper here for the rest of the council, for Riverside Cemetery, we appointed Jesse Timberlake. And I think we have them Thank all. You. Do we also need to mention that the people that were on commissions and boards that were asking to be reappointed, their names aren't listed. Their here. names are not listed, and I didn't bring my old file, so um, I don't know if you have your files. I don't have mine either, but I think yeah. if we just refer by reference that they are being. Yes, the, there there were four people I think that. I got it. Just the one. You have that listed, Henry? Yeah. I think it's right. Sorry about that. That's okay. Yeah, they should be. Which one, Jack? Which ones are they? Do you remember? Is that the one? Um, okay. We have, for Fort Williams Advisory Committee, we have Charlie, Charles McCarthy, who's going for a reappointment for his second term. For the Planning Board, we'd like to reappoint John Seraldo, who's going for his second term. For the Recycling Committee, uh, we'd like to reappoint Darren McClellan, who's just completed, uh, he's gonna, he finished an unexpired term and he now is being appointed for a full term. And that's all. All right. Can you put that in the form of a motion? For yes, I'd like to add those to my motion. I would like the council to accept the slate of uh, new appointees as I have read them. I'd like to second that. Thank you. Any discussion? Uh, yes, Councilor I Berry. would like to thank uh, you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, pinch hitting here in the absence of one of the members of our uh, committee and uh, say thank you to you and to uh, Penny Carson, who is the chairman of that committee We'd spent four long nights on, on this. Uh, it was very difficult to make selections because there are so many talented people who are willing to volunteer in Cape Elizabeth, as you correctly point out, that uh, it was just a treat to have these folks uh, come in for all these committees. I think we've filled all the slates now. So uh, thank you for a good job, Chairman Carson. Thank you. I think we actually have another opening or two already. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Well, Somebody moved, so we actually have some applicants, but we can't do it tonight. So I would second Henry's comments to the quality of people that we had that came forward this year. It's always a, a real pleasure to, in, to get to meet them, interview them, and hopefully be able to get them on to the different committees that we have available. So any further discussion? All in favor? Show it to be unanimous. And, uh,
Again, thank you everyone for uh, applying and coming forward. Now we'll move on. Item number uh, 64-02-03, appointment of Register of Voters. Consideration of the appointment of Deborah Lane to a new two-year term as Register of Voters. And so Main State Law, Title 21A, Section 101, Subsection 2, requires the municipal offices of each municipality to appoint in writing a qualified register of voters by January 1st of each odd-numbered year. The register shall serve for two years until a successor is appointed and sworn. The qualifications of the registrar are that he or she must be a citizen of the United States, a resident of the state, and at least 18 years of age. Yeah, I guess well, she qualifies. That eliminates the clerk. She's only 17, right? <laughs> the registrar may not hold or be a candidate for any state county office or be an officer of a municipal county or state party committee. Debbie has served as the registrar of voters since the reorganization of the registrar and board of register, voter registration in 1995. Having the town clerk serve as the registrar works very well in Cape Elizabeth, both for the day-to-day -day activities and on election day. The registrar, as needed, then appoints deputy registrars. Um, I so move. Second. Any discussion? Or did I cover all of it? Certainly. Were there any other applicants? <laughs> there were none. <laughs> there can be if you would like. <laughs> all in favor of appointing Ms. Lane once again. Show it to be unanimous. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you. Uh, item number 650203, Ordinance Committee report regarding golf courses, consideration of setting a public hearing on Monday, January 13, 2003 at 7.30 p.m. at the Cape Olivet Town Hall of opposed amendments to the zoning ordinance relating to golf courses. John McGinty, our chair of the ordinance committee. Uh, this is uh, here to set for a public hearing for Monday, January 13th at 7.30 here at Town Hall. Um, the uh, zoning ordinance, um, for some reason, left out golf courses when we uh, read the zoning ordinance back in 95, 96. So there was no uh, reference to, to, to golf courses. Um, Paputa Club has been around since the 20s, I believe, so at least 80 years um, kind of officially didn't exist in our zoning ordinance. Um, what we've done, we've defined what a golf course is. We have a definition of golf course. We've also defined what a miniature golf course is, so there can be um, no ambiguity between what is what. Um, we've also placed in uh, both the RA and the RB zones what activities can occur, uh, whether golf courses are permitted um, or uh, uh, permitted or uh, allowed purpose, and also what auxiliary functions um, relate, what we call golf course related activities can occur in both an RA or an RB zone. Um, and we also put in the dimensions for a golf course, uh, minimum lot area for a golf course, which is 150 acres. So we've uh, added those, uh, those uh, points to the uh, ordinance for both the RB and the RA districts. And I'd go be more specific if you'd like um, exactly what uh, in the RB, we're, we're permitting golf course-related activities, excluding restaurants, clubhouses, and meeting halls. And in the RA district, we are permitting golf courses. All right, thank you very much. You want to put that in a form of a motion for us to get set to public hearing, or? I'd, yeah, I'd I'd like so to, and I'd like to second it, a public hearing for January 13th. Thank you. Can I, can I make a clarification? I said for the RA golf courses, it's golf courses and related activities, just to clarify. Fine. Any discussion from council? All right, we move the question. All in favor? Public hearing will be next month. And item number 660203, Ordinance Committee Report regarding open space standards, considerations of setting a public hearing on Monday, January 13, 2003 at 7.30 p.m at the Cape Olivet Town Hall on proposed amendments to the zoning ordinance, clarifying, clarifying how the open space standard is applied to proposed subdivisions in multiple zoning districts. And again, Council McGinty. This is one we wish Maureen was here to help me out on this. Um, I'm certainly not an expert in this, but essentially, again, there was an ambiguity in the ordinance, um, zoning ordinance, that when you had a subdivision that crossed over two different 
zones, for instance, the RA and the RB, um, there was no definitive way of deciding how to determine the open space requirements. Um, so what we've done is we've decided that we would determine the open space requirements in each zone independently for the subdivision. Remember, we've got a subdivision that crosses over several zones, or two zones, presumably, independently for each zone, and then they could place that open space anywhere within the subdivision. So they can move it around anywhere within the subdivision after they determine what the open space requirements are, um, or the density requirements are in each zone. If that makes any sense. As I said, I missed Maureen here to help better explain that. It also We're talking about density. clarifies density. Density yeah. requirements. I said open space. I meant density. All right. Yeah. I have a question for the town manager, I guess. Um, you can answer from Mike. You can answer from there, and I'll just uh, relay it to the mic. Would Maureen be available next month, or should we postpone this perhaps to February, when she would be available to answer those technical questions? She won't. I, I would suggest that perhaps, if if any, I think the three members of the ordinance committee, if I could I answer any for questions. all of them. Well, no, I, are satisfied. So, if the other, with the proposed ordinance, so if the other four members of the council's ha, council had any technical questions, perhaps they could put them in writing beforehand, so that we could clarify an answer, and amongst the three of us, we could answer it. I would hesitate to try and get yeah, Ms. Works. O'Meara in here while she's on family. No, that's what I did not if, want to if do. If the questions were insurmountable, I'm sure we could postpone it, but I don't think they'll be insurmountable. So we can proceed as but scheduled. I think questions in writing ahead of time would help those of us on the Ordinance Committee to formulate our answers. So I know I have a tendency to ramble when trying to answer this, <laughs> so we could be more succinct. So the bottom line is we all know what's on next month, so if we have questions, start looking now and not wait till Monday of the council meeting. Right. <laughs> Very good. Any further discussion? Well, I'm just uh, thinking in order, in order to clarify this sometimes, just looking back into the whole of the ordinance, what precedes this item, you know, and how it fits in helps to clarify, because I think this is talking about clustering and, mm -hmm. and yeah. determining the density in two different areas, and then you can start moving it around. So going back and actually doing a little bit of looking into the wording prior to this. And I would think that any counselor who would have those questions, we all have copies of the zoning right. ordinance, so we yeah. could you know, put it in the proper context and look at it, and if we have questions, we could forward them to Mr. Councilor McGinty as head of ordinance or Fine. is that okay all right I don't believe we have a motion actually to, to send this to public hearing so who would like I, to do I would that? like to move that we set this for public hearing on January 13th second three any further discussion all in favor show it to be unanimous mr. chairman point of order what's the difference between item number 65 and item number 67 on our agenda 65 and 60 Oh, oh. <laughs> I there's, think there's quite a bit of difference on my draft. One's yeah. to golf courses and one's to open spaces. No, and one's appointment to represent. Five is golf courses and 67 uh, is the council of governments. Well, he's talking about 67. Had an earlier draft. And the first 65 was the ordinance committee on golf courses. 67, which is one we'll be getting to now, and I'll read it. Uh, item number 670203, appointment of representative to Greater Portland Council of Governments Executive Committee. Consideration of confirming the consensus at a town council workshop, which we had recently, to appoint Henry Berry III as the town's representative to the Greater Poland Council of Government Executive Committee. If folks will remember, Councillor Swift Kayata indicated that she did not have the time to make that commitment, and Councillor Berry, Berry graciously could, agreed. If, if I could slightly amend the record there, it wasn't that I didn't have the time to do it, it was that I'm on the um, Maine Municipal Association Executive Board, which happens to, their regular meetings happen to be that date. So I'm in Augusta, every one of the COG meetings. So at our August, uh, just to refresh everyone's memory, at our August workshop, we discussed this, 
and councillor very graciously agreed to take my place on that committee. So I Much better to, explanation, I thank you. I just wanted to that. It's not that I was too busy, it's that I'm in Augusta every one of those days. All right. So do we have a motion? So I'll move the appointment of uh, Councillor Berry as the Council's representative to the Greater Portland Council of Government's Executive Committee. Second. And any further discussion? I think I should recuse myself. No, uh, you vote for uh, No, not on these you don't. I don't know. <laughs> vote for yourself, Henry. All right. You don't, don't have anything be, financial to gain here. Unanimous. unanimous. All, in, all in favor. Thank you for him, and it's unanimous. Just, may I say something? Just so no one thinks that Councillor Berry was inappropriately confused, uh, there was an earlier draft. <laughs> there was an earlier draft of the council agenda that it, the first one that went out did in fact repeat that item twice. When I was preparing the agenda, I was using that as the, the cut and paste so that I, so the formatting was all there. So it was in fact in the earlier draft, and it was not. I understand Henry Berry's confusion. So, no, so no one should think that he's confused. Councillor Berry is guilty. So Councillor Berry is guilty of doing his work much earlier he did. He and was, it much was, greater preparation than the rest of us who did it more at the last minute. So he's to be commended. That on top of being gracious, thank you. <laughs> hey, there you go, Henry. <laughs> Item number 680203, acceptance of gifts received since December 1, 2001. Um, the town each year has uh, people all through town uh, giving gift, different gifts and grants and everything else to the town and by state law they have to be accepted by the town council. Uh, oftentimes the council will in fact uh, acknowledge some of them over the course of the year but uh, traditionally they are uh, accepted in mass at the, at the end of the year. Uh, I'll just kind of list a couple of things, but not the money particularly, but we've had gifts to the police department, uh, to Fort Williams, to the fire department, Family Fun Day, Fields for Kids, Arts Commission, Cape Play, Playgrounds. Um, and again, this seems to be, I guess I got two copies of the same thing here, so I won't read it again. And then gifts to the Thomas Memorial Library, um, and gifts to the Thomas Memorial Library from the Friends of Thomas Memorial Library. Um, so that is what that is, um, and Portland Headlight, did I miss that one? I don't want to do them, do I? Don't want to, don't want to forget them, they get a lot of gifts. So with that, that's a brief explanation. So if someone would be, be willing to move that uh, we accept these gifts. I would like to move that we, uh, the council, on behalf of the citizens of Cape Elizabeth, gratefully accept the, um, all these generous gifts to the town, I think it totals up to almost $16,000. On this, I'm sorry, on this sheet right here, but it, yeah, it is much more than that. Actually considerably more, yeah. Much more than that, I'm sorry, I misspoke. No problem. Uh, do we have a second? Second. second? second. All right, and I would just add before we vote that this list, and I don't want to trivialize it by not reading everybody's, because I know everybody's gift is important, but they are on file to what, the clerk's office? Yes, they are. So if anybody was really interested and wanted to check them out, uh, please uh, see Debbie. All in favor of accepting the gifts? And that you can show to be unanimous as well. That uh, ends our regularly scheduled agenda items. Again, we have an opportunity for citizens to discuss anything that's not on the agenda. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to get up and speak? Um, and we do have a couple of people left. But seeing none, um, we can... Move for adjournment. So move. Second. All, and all in favor. And before council leaves, I would note again that uh, we do have a council workshop on Thursday, December 12th. There is the meeting uh, Wednesday, December 11th with the South Portland uh, Council that hopefully most everybody can make. I know at least one person has indicated they do have a conflict. And our next regular meeting will be Monday, January 13, 2003, right here. Don't forget Merry Christmas, everybody. <laughs> Happy Hanukkah uh, and Kwanzaa and the rest of them. Happy New Year. Happy yes. New Year. So thank you, everybody, and uh, we'll see you all later. Go ahead.